person casting out demons must be executing their authority properly or else demons will not obey. The more you execute your authority properly, the more the true authority and anointing grows in you that makes demons see and realize they have to obey. So the proper way of casting out demons is one person in their domain casting out the demons in their domain or in their territory. We have different territories in the spiritual realm. For example, my domain, my territory is, is everyone in the church. Nope. 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 No. Nope. No. Nope. No. Nope. 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 Everyone watching online, everyone who is tuning in right now, this is authority in Christ that I'm talking about. My authority in Christ. You coming and watching alive, you coming in this church right now, that's the action of submitting yourself to God's will. You've taken your body, your soul, your spirit, your whole spiritual life, and you've brought it to be submitted to God's will when you come to church. It's the action of saying, I want God's will to be done in my life which means God's kingdom coming, which means healing, which means freedom, which means abundant life, which means curse is broken, generational curse is broken. And as we see through Peter in the Acts church, it says they would bring the sick and demon possessed underneath his shadow and all were being healed. So we see that this is God's main way of releasing his power, releasing his kingdom, releasing his miracles is to come to the real church where God's kingdom is, where a servant of God is placed in authority, the authority in Christ, having a domain and given a high level of authority to deal with even principalities. And so you come here. This is one of the reasons why you've come here is to be free, to be healed. You're going in God's order. You're submitting your life to Christ here. When you come here, I am given the authority by God to release God's kingdom, release the anointing. I'm given that authority here. And so if you have a demon, when you come here, they're in trouble. It's game over for them because this is my domain. So I say, any demon here, you have to go. This is my territory. This is my domain in Christ. And just like a teacher in a classroom has authority over all children, she says, be quiet, and they all will be quiet. She doesn't need 15 of herself, 14 other people, to issue 14 commands to each person. It's the same way of, in the spiritual realm. This is how authority works. So if there are 20 demons in here, we don't need 20 people to each pray one-on-one -on -one for each person, command each demon. We need a person in authority in Christ, just as Peter was, with real authority, with real anointing, with high-level authority, to say one word, all demons must go. And all have to follow that word. That's how authority works. That's God's order of casting out demons. And then you each have your own domain and territory or ter territory in your spiritual life. Because all who believe these signs shall follow them. They shall cast out demons is one of them. Do you all believe? Yeah. All who believe these signs shall follow. You shall cast out demons. But not anywhere. And not in this church. Unless you are an anointed minister. And I have given you authority to preach on that Sunday, for example. Then this becomes your territory and domain for that Sunday. But if not, your domain and territory to cast out demons is not here, even after church ends. No, because the commands have been issued. God has done what he wants to do. Some people are still being delivered. The anointing is still working in them. But it's out of order to, after church ends, be casting out demons out of people. They've already gone. Or if there's layers, you're forcing deliverance that's supposed to happen tomorrow or the next week, layer by layer. But God's done what he wanted to do already. Your domain, it looks like this. For a lot of you, it looks like this. There's an example that came in actually um, yesterday. This, this uh, woman, she's a, a spiritual daughter of mine who's in Fiji, planted online. And she just shared this testimony that she was in the grocery store yesterday. And she started talking to this woman and this woman opened up to her out of her free will, expressed that she wanted Jesus, freedom and healing. Then that became her territory in the spiritual realm, her domain. That's what your domain looks like throughout life, in your workplace, in your family, in the supermarket. When you start talking to somebody and you start sharing God with somebody and in their free will, they desire prayer. That becomes your territory. Now, if two of you friends from church here are going out, and one of you starts talking to somebody just like this and they open up and they want prayer, that's your domain. It's not you and your friend's domain together. It's not, let's both cast out demons together out of this person. We'll say it together or you can repeat after me and we'll say, get out, get out, get out. No, that's not how authority works. It's the one person who has that domain where that person was in a conversation and opened up to you. That's your domain, not your friend from church's domain too, just yours. This is how it's supposed to work. We never see Jesus saying, Peter, come help me cast out this demon. We never see disciples together commanding demons to go. We never see them praying together over one person together because this is out of order of how authority works. And all that does is make demons not obey you. All that does is make that authority in you not grow to get to the point where demons see you and recognize you like they recognize Paul. And this kind of order is what's been missing in the body of Christ so much today. One of the keys why we, we don't see many demons go. People are dealing with the lower level demons only because their authority isn't growing because they're out of order. The clip that we just watched came from a YouTube video, a message that was ministered at a church in Los Angeles, California called 5F Church by a lady who believes herself to be an apostle. She ministered this word on November 12th, 2023, and her name is Catherine Crick. Today, we will look at the context of what she told the people in this gathering. And we're also going to look at scripture and see what it has to say about church order. And I also wanna make a statement and a plea at the end for those ladies who are listening and following this particular leader. I hope you're ready for what we're getting ready to look at. Let's dive in. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast. 
where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. Thanks for joining me today on this podcast. I appreciate you being here, and I hope that you find this helpful as we work through this message to see if this is biblical, the concerns that are here, um, the undertone of what is being said, and again, a plea at the end for those who are following her. Now, as I said, on November 12th, 2023, Catherine Crick ministered this message at the church she claims to be the head of, 5F Church. She's the pastor slash apostle. And when you even look on her ministry website, all you see is her. You don't see any other leadership mentioned, no other elders, no other leaders, just her. And so it's pointing all to her as being the head or the pastor slash apostle of that church. As the leader of that church, she gave this message on November 12th called Order in the Church. And when I was listening to it, it led me to believe that something may have happened, I don't know, but something may have happened to incite her to give this particular message because she's giving them instructions as we'll see. We won't go through the whole thing. The video was about two and a half hours long. Not all of it was all of her ministering in this capacity, but we're gonna look at several clips from this video so that we can see what she said and talk a little bit about it along the way. And I would encourage you to also use biblical discernment, use your own critical thinking, and obviously the ultimate authority, go back to the word of God, because there's some problems with what she's doing and what she's saying. So with that, we are going to look at some of these clips now and consider what she said in light of scripture. I'm also gonna share an article with you at the end from bible.org that deals with church order and see what it has to say. And it's even going to address some of the issues I believe that we see in this video. So let's get started. Now, early on in this message, before Catherine began to minister, and she does this quite often at her church, she has people come up and give testimonies. And so this young man came up and gave his testimony. Let's hear what he had to say. Like I had PTSD, I was so tormented in my mind. There was suicide attempts in my family and just uh, a lot of abuse, psychological abuse when I was a kid. And Jesus has just freed my mind through your anointed teaching. You are my spiritual mother. I take everything you say and I do it the best I can. I use all the equipping because this church is so amazing and what Jesus is doing with you is just such a blessing. Thank you for your surrender. Thank you for your obedience. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So you can see here that the focus is on her and she's saying, yes, praise the, praise God, praise the Lord. But really the focus is on her. Notice that this young man is saying, I, I got saved. I'm, I'm devoting myself to all your teachings. I do everything you say. This is very concerning because this is not pointing back to scripture necessarily. This is pointing back to her and the revelation that she's bringing and the authority. And you're going to see in this video that she points to that over and over again, or she's alluding to that. But this is not an uncommon thing that happens when you notice in this ministry, they really revere her, for example, and she's not exclusive to this, or this is not isolated to her, but you do see this type of behavior in the New Apostolic Reformation and in other areas. It's not just um, exclusive to the NAR, but you do see this. It's this culture of honor that's being perpetuated. Um, And you'll see in other videos, too, that other people have done. For instance, not too long ago when it was her birthday, the service seemed to gravitate towards her quite a bit at one point, and people were coming up, and this one young man was saying that uh, he was thankful that she had given her life for for the church, seeming to allude to things that are ascribed to Christ, and those things were not corrected. And she was having people bow before her and she was laying their hands on them and giving them a blessing and they were just honoring her. And I, and I will say this, I was part of quite a few services uh, in my time in this movement with the, the leader that I was under that the services got hijacked and that he was honored and revered and videos were made to thank him for his birthday. And I think this still goes on to this day. And it may not be to that extreme of people bowing before him and him laying their his hands on them and and blessing them but still this type of extreme behavior goes on that people will prophesy over the leaders or they'll of course she won't allow that because as you'll see she believes in a certain order that focuses on her as the leader but this type of behavior goes on bringing gifts honoring them during the service and listen i think that we should respect our leaders and that taking a moment to to um, to appreciate what they're doing with their pastor during the uh, 
appreciation month or whatever, but still it was not this. It was to this point of elevating this person and putting them on display. So you'll see this in her ministry that people do this, the testimonies, they're pointing to her, very little pointing to the understanding of the gospel, understanding their joy in Christ of what he has done for them. They're focusing on her. Now, this next clip that we're going to look at, she um, is going to introduce the title of this message today, and you're going to hear her reference her book, The Secret of the Anointing. Let's listen to that for just a second. So today I'm going to be teaching a message called Order in the Church. We are doing, we've been doing a series on my book, The Secret of the Anointing, and we'll continue with that next week. Uh, but today there's a prophetic message about order in the church. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 14, it says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the meetings of God's holy people. The, another translation says, or sorry, the same translation a few scriptures down says, verse 40, but be sure that everything is done properly and in order. This is Apostle Paul speaking to a church congregation, and he's telling them God is a God of order, and when it comes to church, when, in the meetings, when we gather together as believers, it's important that we are also in order because our God is a God of order, not chaos. So we also have to be in order too, and not just any order, but in God's order like how God wants the order to be. He has order. He has a way. He has rules, principles, laws. He has a system. He has a way in which he wants his work to go forth. So preaching from your own book, uh, let alone about the secrets of the anointing, that, that should be a concern. That should raise some questions, right? Because the final authority that we should have in a church gathering is scripture. So ladies, I would encourage you, you need to consider that if you listen to her or if you know people that are listening to her, I hope that this video will serve as something to bring pause because that should not be taking place. We need to be upholding the word of God as the, the standard and the final authority and the complete sufficient revelation of all that we need to know about God and all that we need to know about the anointing and other things. But as you'll see, like I said, sad to say, this is not going to be the focus. Scripture's not the focus. It's, it's what her revelation is and what her thoughts are on the matter. Now, I want you to notice something else, too, in this clip that I just showed you, where she stopped in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, because she didn't read the entire verse. And there's a reason for that. So she started to read the second half of 1433, and then she stopped, and then she went on to verse 40. Let's see what Scripture says, what she failed or decided to omit from what she was teaching the congregation. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. But that verse goes on to say, as in all the churches of the saints, verse 34, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. Verse 35, if there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. So she's talking about the corporate gathering of the church in this context. Verse 36, or was it from you that the word of God came, or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. So the context matters there of what she's talking about. But she's going to use this to promote it forward and push it forward of the things that she's getting ready to tell these people. That God has a way of doing things, that he wants to heal and do deliverance, and so he has an order in doing things. She tells the people also that they can't have their own agenda. And she goes on to tell them, quote, your behavior is connected to God's ability to move and to touch people. So I think that the argument can be made here that there is the sovereignty of God that's being called into question here, whether that's intentional or unintentional. But when you say that God is only able to move based on your ability to connect to what he's doing, then I would argue that you're the one that's limiting God not the ones that hold the Bible in high regard and the standard of truth with God actually speaking in his word. Just something to think about. And this argument she continues on with of even saying that the more united we are, the more God can move. So again, there's some partial truth to this, but at the same time, 
a little convoluted and also calling into question, I believe, the sovereignty of God, that he is dependent upon us and being united because his hands are tied, essentially. If we don't get our act together, then he just can't do what he wants to do because he's given us domain. And this goes back, as I've said before, this goes back to word of faith teaching that is tied in. There's multiple streams that are running into the New Apostolic Reformation that are attributing to a lot of these um, these errant and uh, false teachings that are going on that are causing more problems than they are really uh, true unity in Christ. Now, in this next clip we're going to look at, she talks about apostles and what they do to put things in order. I distinctly remember hearing stuff like this under the leader I was under. So again, she's going to say some things that some of you are going to recognize as New Apostolic Reformation teaching, but let's see what she has to say about apostles and what she tells the people here concerning herself. So as Paul was speaking to this church, the church in Corinth, as he was speaking to them, this is how the order in the church should be. I'm going to be speaking as an apostle to you today of how the order should be. This is so important. If it's in the word, if Paul's speaking this to the church, then it's important to be spoken now. And a rhema word now. Rhema means present tense, word of God spoken. And we are in the end time revival now. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we are in that season right now of transformation of the church. That's the season we're in. Beautifying. So there needs to be change in the church. There needs to be change in terms of the order in the church. Um, and a big role of an apostle is to make sure that the foundation of the body of Christ, of the church, is how it should be. Apostles are the first ones sent out. They have this special grace of pioneering, meaning like, I know how this foundation needs to be laid, how God wants it to be laid. They have that grace. And they have that grace to see what's out of order. And they have that grace and responsibility to get it in order. That's the big job of the apostle. And this is what Paul was doing as an apostle, bringing correction, uh, making there to be order where there was disorder in the church, making the foundation to be how it should be, getting it back into place. Amen? So this is what's happening now. This is a big reason why we haven't seen good order, how it's godly order in the church, by and large, is because apostles have been missing, by and large. So there's not that grace to say, this is out of whack. This is not how God wants ministry to be done, for example, the church to be conducted. Um, so there's not that grace without the apostles. So she is coming as Paul did. She is making herself to be an apostle of Christ, it sounds like, a big A apostle. And I don't think that you can skirt around that of her saying that because she believes herself to be an apostle. In fact, she believes that her church that she established is where the power is found. And she alludes to this and she says this, uh, instructing them that, you know, they need to bring the people where the power of God is found. And unfortunately, she says most of the church is just not operating in this power. That that's why demons aren't cast out on a routine basis, that people aren't healed on a routine basis, that they're just not hearing the power of God or seeing the power of God. And if I could be so bold to say this to you, and I don't say this lightly, the things that you're going to hear today and you've already heard, there there's language in here and um, behavior that is leading to cult-like uh, beliefs that is the formation of a cult. When you're putting a, a leader up on a pedestal, you're revering them, you're exalting them, you're looking to them to guidance. She's going to say in this service that in church order, she is the one to do all the things. And she said that in the introduction in how to effectively cast out demons, that she is the one, there's not 15 that are needed of her, like a, like a school teacher in a room, which I find that very interesting that she's, using that analogy and she uses that analogy of children several times in this service when she's ministering to these people and it's it seems very denigrating frankly that she's it's almost like she's looking down on them and that she's a school marm or a school teacher and she's telling them what to do and having to keep them in line and having to babysit them i mean there's certain things that she says throughout here that when i was listening to it i thought well this is really sad uh, first of all, that these uh, we're going to address the biggest thing, because what's ironic is that she's out of order by what she's doing um, in, in the leadership role that she has taken over this church. That That's the irony of all of this. But I'm jumping the gun a little bit. But nevertheless, she is promoting this um, elevation of herself in false humility while telling the people and using this example. Well, there's not 15 of me that are needed to cast out demons. Basically, she's telling them, you all don't need to be doing this. It's all focused on me and what I'm doing. 
I'm the one that's on the spotlight here. I'm the one that has the domain and the authority to cast out demons. You don't. Go to the grocery store and go to your workplace and do that, but let me have the spotlight. I don't know the heart intentions that she has. I don't know her motives, um, but I can, and you can, judge the fruit. We are to inspect and judge fruit. We are told that in scripture. So the fruit of this is showing self-exaltation. It's showing propping one up as the sole leader, as the one that has all the authority, has the domain over demons there. And again, I don't know if something's happened in this service that she's trying to bring order to this, but my assumption would be that something has happened in this service and she's wanting to rein it back in to where the focus is on her. But she said to these people that she has domain over those that come online, that come to the church. So her domain is the church. Now, whether she meant the church, she believes she established there. Um, and again, we get into semantics with who is the church um, and who is the head of the church. And we're going to talk about that in the article that we look at in a little bit. But she makes a point in that original clip that you heard, that, that first clip of saying those that come online and watch her or those that come in the church, they are submitting to her authority. That she has domain over them to cast demons out of them and, and do different things. Well, what happens when people are just coming on to watch that they don't believe that she's their pastor or their, their spiritual mother, but they're just coming on to watch and they attend a different church? Is she not usurping someone else's domain? And then she's telling people, you don't go out and two of you don't cast out demons. I, I Again, I would encourage you to go look at the gospel and see the, even the instructions that Jesus gave his disciples when he sent them out two by two. And she's trying to make it all on one person and then saying, well, your domain, when you go out, just one of you of the two should cast out the demon because you're taking territory or you're taking authority over that person. I mean, the things that she's saying, there's no scripture to back this up. If anything, the scripture, um, it, it rejects what she's saying, but yet she's not providing any scripture to back up what she's saying. But she's telling these people, well, you, your domain's in the grocery store. Well, what if someone else goes in the grocery store and they believe they can cast out demons? Are you not usurping their domain? Do you see how this teaching that she's doing is not lining up with scripture and it's not logical? She's making this up. She's making up this doctrine. And again, that's a very scary thing to do. And that shows a lack of reverence for God's word. That shows that his word is not sufficient in order to understand these things in order to, um, to divide truth from error, in order to walk in his ways and to glor truly glorify him. So I wanted to point those things out, but we're gonna keep going because there's quite a few clips I wanna show you and just touch on. And then again, I wanna get to this article because I think it's gonna be very helpful to you as you work through this and realize that there are some major concerns with what she's doing. When I was teaching about impartation, I was teaching about this principle of God releasing the anointing to the head, to a leader. He calls them to do, to start a church, to start a ministry, a specific servant of God, and he anoints them. He gives them the vision, he anoints them, and then he calls people to come underneath that leader and help carry out that work. Because a leader cannot do it alone. We were called to work as a team, as an army. But they come, they come in order. They, come, they don't come any old way, they come in order. They, they come under. The order, the right order is to come under. Psalm 133.1, this is the last scripture. Psalm 133, one, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. So that's a picture of the order of church. It's the picture of the anointing flow, and it's the picture of order. Order. So the leader of the church, the apostle, the pastor, whoever's the, the leader, the servant of God, would be considered like the head in this example. And then the, the uh, next person in leadership below that leader, the main leader, would be the beard. And then the next in leadership beyond the beard would be this, this area of the robe. And then all the rest would come under until the, the bottom of the robe. Amen. So the people here can't jump up here and certainly not here. There's order, not just of how the impartation of anointing flows. So also this means like the one receiving the beard would also receive more anointing than down here. And these would be, these would be lesser levels according to God's plan, purpose. Okay, so I touched on the fact that she referenced about the head the head of the church. Who is the head of the church? I want you to think about that. But she believes herself to be the head, and she's referencing Psalm 133 of um, the anointing going on Aaron's head and onto his beard. 
very strange interpretation. I've never heard that before, what she's saying, dividing it up and saying people have a lower anointing uh, and get the more anointing. Again, scripture does not support that. It does not. Read 1 John 2, 20 and 27. John never talks about that people have a lesser anointing than someone else. The Holy Spirit has anointed believers because of Jesus Christ, because he sent the helper, the comforter to us as believers. There is no hierarchy of the anointing. So again, this do a study on Psalm 133. Listen to Bible teachers and solid pastors on Psalm 133 to understand what this means. Because what she's telling you is not lining up with scripture. She says that the job of the shepherd is to protect the church. She also says that the job of the shepherd is to make sure they're getting the word of God. So the question is, why didn't they get the word of God when she read 1 Corinthians 14? Because she did not read all of those passages. And she left that out and conveniently left that out about that women are to be silent in the church. They're not to have um, authority over a man. And we even will look at this later, in case you may not know this or be aware of it, that Paul addressed this in the epistles to Timothy and to Titus about the qualifications of an overseer or an elder in the church, even deacons. And we need to be aware of that. And so she's, she's rejecting that. She's not being a shepherd. Um, in fact, this is the, the pattern of a wolf that's coming in among the flock, that's trying to devour them and trying to deceive them and lead them back to themselves. Paul warned the, the leaders in Ephesus and Acts 20 that these things would happen, that when he departed, that there would be wolves that would come in, fierce wolves that would try to take those out of the flock. And there would even be those among them that would do that, trying to lead men after themselves. He warned them this would happen. And it's happening today. And ladies, I got to encourage you, please go back to scripture if you, if again, if you happen to stumble across this podcast, this video, and you're following Catherine Crick, or you have loved ones that are, they really, they need to be warned. This is unbiblical, and this is dangerous. This is a dangerous path to go down. It's leading away from Christ. It's leading away from the truth of the gospel. It's leading away from the truth of God's word. She says that we are to respect the order that no one can get up and say, thus says the Lord. Now, when she's talking about this, she's telling them that you are not allowed to get up in her church, in her gathering, and to say, I have a word from the Lord and I need the microphone. She is the only one that is permitted to give permission for that. She said she will give permission to people at times or that authority. If they minister on a Sunday and she's not, then they are now um, over that domain. So the authority of the domain changes apparently. Now, in this next clip, when she addresses church order, she's going to be talking about the word or the message, and she's going to refer to Romans 10, 17. Let's listen to that. So now I want to, we're going to talk about the word, the message, the sermon, the proper order when the word is given, being spoken. So Romans 10, 17, the Amplified Version, faith comes from hearing what is told, and what is heard comes by the preaching of the message concerning Christ. This, the, 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 the NKGV is a version maybe most of you are familiar with it, it says, then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Passion Translation says, faith then is birds in a heart that responds to God's anointed utterance of the anointed one. So faith is essential to everything. Faith is essential to growing in your relationship with God. Faith is essential to receiving miracles. Faith is essential to do what God has called you to do on this earth. It is all rooted in faith. And the word of God says where faith comes from. One of the biggest ways that faith comes is when you hear the anointed utterance of the word. When you hear the word spoken, or those who are deaf, if they see, these, if they're reading, that can be another meaning of hear. Those who hear the word, they will receive faith. Okay, red wow. flag, red flag on the field. <laughs> because I've noticed this too when I've listened to her messages. She frequently reads from the Passion Translation. Huge red flag. The Passion Translation is not a translation. It is a. It is not even a paraphrase. If you listen to some of the things, such as Mike Winger, who has done an excellent job looking at this, he did a Passion Project. He did a few uh, videos prior to this, extensively looking at the Passion Translation. In fact, it was Mike Winger's work that helped me to understand the error that I was in as I was being considered for writing Bible studies for the Passion Translation by his publishers. And so thank the Lord, none of that came to fruition. 
the contact fell through with that and I was never um, part of that project but I was being considered but it was his work that helped me to understand and realize there are major concerns with the passion translation so I would advise you and suggest please do not read the passion translation because it will confuse you and it is not an actual translation and if anything uh, Brian Simmons has propped himself up almost like a Joseph Smith in a way and that he's got a revelation that Jesus came to him and breathed on him to get the translation. I've talked about that in another podcast. If you're interested, I have that on my episodes, but we'll get back to Catherine Crick right now. But again, do not, do not, please do not read the Passion Translation. Now, Romans 10, when she's, just listen to what she's saying about this, but Romans 10, the context of Romans 10, again, just for time's sake, but read it. Read Romans 10 in context. Many of us have heard Romans 10, 17 out of context in a word of faith context that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ and you got to speak the word out and that's how your faith is built. But Romans 10 is talking about the proclamation of the gospel and that faith comes through hearing the word of Christ through the proclamation of the gospel of proclaiming salvation and the pastor when he preaches salvation through the written word of God that is rhema, that is the spoken word of God. This is not extra biblical revelation we're talking about. This has already been revealed through God's son, Jesus Christ. So that's good news. It's good news to us. That's what it's talking about. But again, this is lost. It's lost in what she's saying to these people. And that's really sad. Now, this next clip, she's going to be referencing church order as far as preaching the word. Let's have a moment to listen to this. She's going to reference a passage in, in Ephesians for this. Have a listen. So how important is the preached word of God? So important. So important. Woo. I'm getting more pumped to preach as I think about this, as I speak about this. Ooh, this is powerful. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so when the word of God is being spoken like it is right now, this means that every single person here should have their focus on one thing, hearing the word of God. Nothing else. Nothing else. Hearing. You don't want to miss a thing. You want to hear every single word spoken. You don't want to miss out on an ounce of faith that you will receive from this. And this word of God that's coming forth, this is, is how you are equipped, as it says in Ephesians 4, that it, 411, that the, the fivefold ministry was given to the body of Christ to equip the believers to bring them to maturity, to equip them for works of service. So also as you're here, not only is your faith growing so that all these things can happen, miracles can take place in your life. You get closer to God, you can hear from God, but also you're being equipped. Now she talks about distractions and throughout the remainder of this sermon that she, that she ministers, she's gonna talk about distractions, which is, it's really interesting what she says. Again, it makes me think something's happened because she starts saying, don't be a distraction to people. You know. Don't, uh, don't just shout amen and hallelujah at, the cert at certain times or, or shout in tongues uh, when it's inappropriate because that's out of order. But then there's times that you should do that, such as when she's preaching, you should say amen. So she wants the applause and she wants the accolades and she wants the acknowledgement of what she's saying is correct and that they're agreeing with it, but she wants it on her terms. She's telling them, you know, if you don't go up and down and, and if you need to go to the bathroom, it's okay. That happens. But try to go to the bathroom before service. So that way you're not distracting people. Or if you have something on your body that makes a lot of noise, take it off. So that way it's not distracting. Um, maybe, maybe you're wearing something on your body that's really loud when you move around. Maybe take that off. <laughs> so, no, simple things. Simple things, you know, that could be a, you, you turn your phone on silent. Make it a practice. And you should take this seriously. Like, lives are going to be changed today by this word. Mine and everyone else. So this is going to look like being quiet, very quiet most of the time, and not moving around, you know, during the word. But also, during the word, there can be a time to be loud, and it's a good thing. Like saying amen. Uh, hallelujah. And sometimes even you feel in your heart, ooh, fire from the word. You, I mean, the amen is bursting out of you more than your mouth. So you got to stand up. You got to clap for the word of God. Not any person, but the word of God and God's truth. You know? And so we have this happen sometimes at church. Sometimes there's moments that we see some people are standing up, clapping for a moment. That's good. That's not a distraction. That's actually good. But that's in the right time. That's in order. 
that's being led by the Holy Spirit. Distracting for them or distracting for her? Drawing attention away from her or drawing attention away from the word is the question I would have with that. And you'll notice that she's talking about the anointing here and she tells the people as she goes on that the more engaged you are and the more hungry you are, that the more anointing that you're going to get. That the level of the anointing you receive depends on your response. And she used the example of Jesus, how when Jesus was in a specific place that they didn't receive the anointing, they didn't receive healing, and they didn't receive deliverance because they rejected him and they didn't want to listen to him. Whereas when he went into other places, the anointing was more available. So she's going to use that passage about Jesus to equate to her church service and to her teaching of church order and to tell the people, again, no scripture to back this up that the more engaged you are and the hungrier you are, the more anointing you receive. There's no biblical passage that says that. Why is there such an emphasis and a focus on you operating in power and the anointing? The anointing is to help conform you to the image of Christ and to help you be led by the Spirit of God to understand scripture, to be sanctified. And the scripture helps us to understand that in our obedience to Christ, because we have been justified by Christ himself, we are continuing on into sanctification. And in that we are being conformed and transformed by God, by the power of his spirit and by the power of his word. The anointing that's on our lives because of the Holy Spirit is actually on display. And that's on display with you submitting to your husband in, in a godly way of what scripture says. It's on display with you uh, taking care of your children, taking care of your home. If you are staying home, if you're working, then you're doing your work as unto the Lord. There's such a diminishment in the day-to-day -day things. You are not going to your, your life is not a walking miracle as far as you doing all of these great exploits that people deem great exploits. Your walk with Christ is found in the mundane day by day of you doing the things that God has told you to do as a wife and as a mother and as his disciple. And we find that in scripture. And that is enough for us to know how to walk in his ways and to glorify him. So when people are doing this, it's really sad because the anointing will be automatically thought miracle signs and wonders. And if you're not having these things and you're not hearing the voice of God for yourself and you're not able to attest to all of these manifestations, then you really don't have the anointing. And that's, that's not found in scripture. That is not found in scripture. And these were not even things that Paul highlighted and emphasized as being those that were set apart for Christ's sake, and that we're walking in the way that they should walk according to the word of God and according to the power of his spirit. I want to encourage you in that. And I would give great caution to the thought of, because you're not doing the things that these leaders attest to doing, which those things need to be tested in and of themselves to see if they're even real, because these could certainly be counterfeits and inauthentic and fake and, um, actors being used. There's been speculation of that in some of these instances. Uh, there's so many things to consider with that, that we need not hold, uphold a man or woman, in this instance, a woman in such a position. We need to uphold the word of God and we need to uphold um, the of God's work in our life in even the mundane day-to-day -day things and give him all the glory in everything we do in word and deed, as we're told in Colossians to do in word and deed, that we are to do all things to the glory of Jesus Christ and to the glory of God the Father. Now she's going to get into the order of casting out demons, and this is where that original clip came from that she made herself and put on her page. Actually, she uploaded it February of this year, and that came from the service in November of last year. So in addition to what she said about casting out demons effectively, she also had these things to say. She's going to go on to this next clip talking again about the anointing. Now, the demons can see the Holy Spirit in all Christians, but not all Christians carry the authority to cast out demons. That comes by receiving anointing when God can see he can trust you. And that's not brain science. That's obvious with the state of the church today. 
No demons manifesting, no demons going. That means no anointing. That means no authority. And we sure see that is the prevalent way of the church today. So we know this to be true, that not every Christians actually carry that authority that demons recognize and obey. The authority comes with the anointing. The anointing destroys the yoke, Isaiah 10, 27. The anointing comes when God sees he can trust you, and then he releases that anointing because that anointing is real power, and it, it, it's the power over other people's lives. God can't give that to just anybody. You are given authority over your own spiritual life, and you can reject and rebuke the devil and walk in victory every day, but you're, you're automatically given that, but you're not automatically given the authority and power over other people. You have to earn God's trust. You have to pay the price, the cost of the anointing. She Amen. mentions Ephesians 6 and about the rank of demons. Again, many of us have heard this type of talk before, this teaching about the rank of demons and principalities, powers, rulers over this present darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places. Some of us were taught that this was the fivefold antithesis to the fivefold ministry. That's what I was taught in demonology. But what is the point? Is that the focus? Is that the emphasis? Or is it on how to engage in correct biblical spiritual warfare? And who is the one that's emphasized and spotlighted in spiritual warfare? It's not us, it's Christ. Now in this teaching in Ephesians 6, when she does this about the higher ranking demons, and again, I'm familiar with this, she says that the apostles are the uh, higher ranking in authority and that's why they can cast out territorial spirits. Naranese, <laughs> this is Naranese. I, I've used that term before. But this is Naranese talk. So if you're familiar, you're familiar with this. If you if you've been in this movement and you've heard this teaching, is that the apostles are viewed as the, as the higher ranking and that they are the ones that are able to go after territorial spirits. See, Peter Wagner wrote books on this about territorial spirits, about spiritual warfare, about apostles and their rank in the spirit, about how they can overcome these spirits. I was engaged in this practice for years in intercessory prayer about trying to overcome the, the ranking spirit in our region and in other areas of the world. These are dangerous practices that are engaged and they're unbiblical. We're not told to do these things. We're not told that and to, to overcome these things and apostles will believe they can go into territories and to overcome certain spirits and things. The focus is to be on Christ, uh, not the sovereignty of Satan, I, I wear that term out a lot, but I'm going to stick to my guns on that because in the deliverance ministry, that's the focus. Satan's sovereign. God is apparently off somewhere and that he's given us domain, uh, but we've lost our domain to, because of Satan and Satan is sovereign over everything. Now, these leaders would not say that, but their teachings are supporting that. And Satan is not sovereign. God is sovereign. God is even sovereign over Satan. And what he's able to do, he is limited in what he can do. He has to ask permission to do things. Now, what I also found interesting that she mentioned in the in the very first clip I played was that she says that demons recognize um, order and authority. And so if you're trying to cast demons out in the service, like she's saying, and you're doing it after the service is over, after she's already been given the authority and she's cast out all the demons that are going to leave and that you're forcing deliverance, if you try to cast demons out after the fact, but she tells these people that demons will go when they exercise their authority in order. So she doesn't want anybody else but herself casting demons out of 5F church. And I also find it problematic <laughs> that she's going to go on to talk about fake manifestations and things, um, which I find ironic, but she's going to go on to talk about how people have been set free in this atmosphere and the lower ranking demons didn't even need to be cast out, that they just left during the services because of her authority in that place. But why in a church that's supposed to be so filled with the spirit, why are demons so prevalent? Why do they want to come to a service where they know they're going to be cast out? Now, demons are not omnipresent, but you would think that a person that's coming to a church that claims to have all of this power and authority and the anointing of God so strong, you would think that you would be seeing more fruit coming from people that is demonstrating that they are truly transformed by the power of Christ. So I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering why we're seeing in a church gathering, a corporate service, why we're seeing so many demons that feel comfortable being there. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. And she also mentions Acts chapter 5, verses 15 and 16 in the description of this video as well in this clip, which when you look at Acts chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, this is talking about Peter's shadow, that people would bring uh, the sick out on cots and lay them in the street in chance that Peter would walk by and his shadow would fall upon them. And she's using that passage in a proof text way to validate her position on church order in what she's saying. So here's the $64,000 question. If she's going to use Acts 5, 15 and 16, and focus on Peter's shadow, then I, I want to ask, is her shadow healing people? Because if she's going to use this passage in a prescriptive way, not descriptive, not talking about the historical account, because there's nothing in here that gives us the command to do this. And again, if she's going to uphold this example of Peter, then she is looking at herself as an apostle of Christ. And there are no apostles today because we have the word of God and the apostles are still ministering to us today through scripture, but she's going to use this example. So is her shadow healing people? Because if it's not, then the scripture is null and void for what she's trying to say it, it is to be used for. Now, in this next clip, she's going to talk about that there are no more commands to issue. And she's going to go on to warn the people about who they should listen to. In church, this means, this is why we don't have a bunch of people laying hands, a bunch of people yelling, get out, get out, get out, like with me or something. This is why after church, there's not people standing in the front and say, come and receive prayer. Because this is out of order in the spiritual realm. The commands have been issued. The demons have obeyed. God has done everything he wants to do. We don't go and issue another command over that. It's out of order. And it doesn't do anything in the spiritual realm except for bring disorder. Well, as I've ministered, the only time I've seen pe people with demons have to be held back from me because it really looked like, like they were really strong and going like, to attack me through a man, for example. The only time I've seen that happen and the only time I've seen demons like, like hurt, try to hurt someone like literally bring physical harm to someone because they possess their body and um, got a little hurt. Not bad, a little hurt. The only time I've seen that is when there was not this unity and order. Like maybe someone who had invited me to minister didn't respect this certain order. Now, I would agree with her. I think you need to be careful who you listen to. Nobody is above correction. Nobody is above um, examination, including myself, all of us are to be examined when we're saying something and we're claiming that it's what scripture says or that certainly if someone is claiming that they're getting extra biblical revelation and they're saying thus says the lord because when you say thus says the lord then you're automatically assigning authority to it stamped by god approved by god and on par with scripture so when she says that they need to be careful who they listen to, I would agree with her on that. You need to be careful who you listen to. And you need to be careful of what she's saying in teaching. She also tells them regarding prophecy. She briefly touches on this to follow the order of prophecy and that they are not to give directional uh, words to people. Again, it seems like she's the only one that's allowed to do that. But they can certainly edify and, and exhort one another. They can encourage one another, but they are not to give directional words within her domain. And she says when they know the order, then they will recognize when something is out of order. There's a lot of irony, again, in what she's saying. Um, and and I'm sad to say that there's a lot of dependency on biblical illiteracy in this. If there were people that were reading scripture there and they were reading it in context, they would be leaving by the droves. They would be leaving because of, of what's taking place there. And I pray that she comes to repentance and that those that are following her repent and turn from this. Uh, because what she's doing is she's, she's flagrantly disobeying Scripture and what she's doing and what she's telling these people and she's leading them away from Christ. And when she's telling them that when they recognize the proper order, then they will recognize um, disorder, it almost seems as if that she's directing them to her, that she will know the proper order of things, that they, she doesn't need them to use their discernment or their warnings or their anything that they say from the Lord. 
she will get that and she will be the one that will understand and discern properly what is truth and what is error. Again, leaders are not established within the body of Christ when they lead to, uh, to operate this way. There are checks and balances that are put into place. And again, the concern, there, there's nothing on their, her website of the ministry to say there are elders. Where are the, the elders here? Where are other leaders that hold this woman accountable? And I know that there are people that are going to say, well, what about the fact of the qualifications? We'll get, we'll get there, but I'm just talking in theory. There, there's nothing there that is showing that she's being accountable to anyone within this church that's viewed as someone with, um, with eldership and with understanding. That's a huge red flag. Now, in the next area of church order, she goes on to talk about ministry and prayer time. And again, she wants to instruct the people about how they're to conduct themselves. When she's praying over people and she's being quiet, they need to be quiet. That when an usher is standing there or somebody, when she's uh, praying over someone or prophesying over them or whatever, that they don't need to amen her every single time that she's talking. <laughs> I kid you not. This is what was what was said. So she puts these parameters up, but then she'll say, but then if I say something again, if I say something that requires an amen, then you can say that. Now, during the ministry and prayer time, she said there are two requirements that they need to do or two things that they need to do during this time in her gatherings. The first thing is, is that they need to position themselves to receive. They need to be quiet and position themselves to receive. The second is to have the fear of God. And she references Acts chapter 2, verse 43. Again, you can read that in context. But she uses that in order to validate the call to have the fear of God and what she views as the fear of God. And she tells them at the same time, if they're going to shout, do it genuinely. If you're going to shout powerfully, then be genuine about it. Don't, don't, do, it just to, don't do it just to draw attention to yourself. Again, it's very confusing because if someone does claim, let's say someone claims that they're, that they're saying it in a, in a, um, in a way that the Holy Spirit's inspiring them, but she views it as being out of order. Who's right? She's going to defer to herself because she views that she's the only one that's hearing clearly from God and that she's the one that's going to tell them you're out of order when they're saying, but I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me to do that. And lastly, she tells them about the order for spiritual insight. And she encourages them that they need to rest while they're in the service. They just need to sit back and receive and rest. Thank you, Lord. And lastly, I want to mention this last order. The order for spiritual insight being given will come from the leader. The same principle of the oil coming on Aaron's head, down his beard, on the rest of the body. That's the same way spiritual insight, direction will come forth. So you sitting here, you do not need to, like, worry. All you need to do is sit, rest, and receive. In terms of um, dangers in the spiritual realm to the church or something, in terms of wolves or something like that, you don't need to like be on guard and be an undercover spy or something spiritually and just rest and receive. Because when it comes to insight, when it comes to direction, when it comes to, um, oh, this is a way the enemy's trying to come and bring division in the church or something, or this is person's like dangerous or um, God will reveal that to me and lead me of what to do. She tells them to rest while they're in the service and that they don't, they just need to sit and receive. They don't need to be thinking about, oh, this person's out of order, or this person's a danger, or uh, having to use discernment. And I got to say, it's almost as if she's telling them, just shut off your critical thinking. Let me do the thinking for you. I'll be the one to determine. God will tell me if there's someone that's a danger or anything. Well, <laughs> Catherine, um, I got to say, you know, and, and to those that would listen to her, you need to question that teaching right there because there are wolves that are that are creeping in to the flock and they are trying to devour people they are trying to lead people after themselves as i told you earlier they're trying to lead people astray you're not to shut off your critical thinking you need to rest in god you need to rest if you're in christ and you and you have placed your faith and trust in him to to save you from the wrath of god to save you from the penalty of your sins to to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness and to give you the promise of eternal life in him alone, then you can rest in that. You can have peace in that. But that rest is not you shutting your brain off during a church service 
and not paying attention to what's taught and what's said. Whether you're in a solid church or you're in something like this that is a mess, you are to use biblical discernment. That is scriptural and that is a command of the Lord. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And she's not above that command. We are to test everything in accordance with scripture. We are to test fruit and we are not to shut our brains off and just rest and just let her do all the thinking for you or let anybody else do the thinking for you. That's unbiblical. And that's not good instruction for someone to give to another professing believer. She says spiritual direction and instruction is not to be done through the people, but it's to be done through her and through other leaders like herself. And this is the new wine. Again, new wine is code talk. It's Naranese. That's C. Peter Wagner type. This, this old wine, the religious wine skin, the new wine is this new thing that God is doing. The new, the new move of God, the new revival that's coming. Now, I want to refer you to this article I found, and I'm going to post the link below in the description of this, of this episode, but it's from Bible.org, and the title of this article was, Who's in Charge of the Church? This is based on 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, and other scriptures. There's audio that's provided with this. The author of this was Stephen J. Cole, who served as a pastor of Flagstaff Christian Fellowship from May 1992 through his retirement in December of 2018. And he was also the pastor of Lake Gregory Community Church in Crestline, California. He graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. And so I, this was published in 2013. I would highly suggest that you look at it, but I just want to touch on a few things before we end our time today. One of the things that he touches on near the beginning of this uh, article, he says, Christ exercises headship over his church through spiritually mature elders who shepherd his flock. The first point that he makes here in this article is this. The basic principle of church government is that Jesus Christ is the head of his church. It's not a man, and it's certainly not a woman. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So even in her reference in Psalm 133, with Aaron and his beard and the anointing flowing over it, she's looking upon herself as she's the head. She is not the head. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And any man or woman who would try to lay claim to such things is not obeying scripture. The next point that the author makes in this article is to say this, Christ exercises his headship through spiritually mature elders. And he says there are two main terms used interchangeably in the New Testament to describe church leaders, elders and overseers. We see this term used in Titus chapter 1 verses 5 and 7 and Acts chapter 20 verses 17 and 18. Elders uh, which is also seen in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, looks at the man himself. It refers to a man of maturity, not necessarily in years, but in spiritual discernment. While the Bible doesn't put any age requirement on the office, he says that an elder under 30 should be an exception. A third word he uses in this article that's found in Scripture is pastor, which equals shepherd, is used in noun form only once for church leaders in Ephesians 4.11 where Paul says that God has gifted some as pastors and teachers, the two concepts being tied together. The verb is used of church leaders in several places, and he references John chapter 21, verse 16, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. In 1 Peter 2, 24, Jesus is called the shepherd, pastor, and guardian overseer of our souls. Thus, human pastors and overseers work under and are accountable to the Lord Jesus, the chief shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. The word pastor looks at the work from the analogy of a shepherd and his sheep. He references a fourth word that means to stand before or first in the Greek, and it means to lead or have charge over, which is referenced in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, and verse 12, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 17, and Romans 12, verse 8. He goes on to talk about other words that are also used in talking about servanthood that are talked about that that are referencing meaning to lead or to rule. So again, I would refer you to this article, but there's something I want to point out here. And it's a little bit longer article, but it's definitely worth the read. But I want to point this out here because this is the entire irony of this message that she's giving about church order. And I dare say it's the reason why she avoided reading 1 Corinthians 1434 and reading the second part in context with it in 1433. 
he makes the note in this article, elders should be men, not women. He, he references that leadership in the local church is to be male. We can see this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. They're not to be female. In order to preserve God's order instituted in creation, but violated in the fall. Also, every time elders are mentioned in the New Testament, they are men, not women. And I don't see how you could get around this, but the qualifications are explicitly listed and described in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. They are to be the husband of one wife. That right there at the beginning should help us to see women are not to serve and to have authority over men in the church gathering, in the corporate service to serve as pastors. They're not to be shepherds. All of these passages that I just listed, they make the qualifications plain. And this article even talks about this, that this office is for men. Again, the husband of one wife. So this means that the elder who is supported as the teaching pastor, 1 Timothy 5, 17, must be a man. So women may serve on the, the local church staff as teachers of women. And we see this in Titus chapter 2, verse 2. But women are not to have authority over men. And if we're going to ignore scripture on that, and when we go to a corporate church gathering and we say that we're submitted to the authority of a woman as she's standing in a pulpit and ministering the word of God to men and women telling, and she's telling them, Catherine Crick is telling these people, I have authority in this place. If you're watching online, you're submitting to my authority. She's violating scripture. She's disobeying scripture. And not only that, she conveniently left out that passage when she read 1 Corinthians 14. And essentially, she deceived the people that she was teaching, the very people that she claims to shepherd. She was deceiving them. She was denying them the full counsel of the word of God. And ladies, that's not okay. That's very dangerous. And she's going to be held accountable for that just as we all are accountable for our actions. And so again, I'm, I'm gonna refer you to this article. I'll have the link to it. I think it's a really good read. And sometimes we want to avoid things. I know that when I was coming out of this movement that I wanted to avoid talking about standing in a, in a corporate gathering with men and women. Uh, I was allowed to do that at times. I was allowed to prophesy over men and women stand in a place of authority. I was allowed to teach men and women about prophecy and about demons and about the Bible at times. I was permitted to do that. Now, yes, I did also do this at women's conferences in a, on a handful of occasions, but I was permitted to do these things. This is out of order. We are not as women to have authority over men in such a way. Now, I understand that our culture, they, they don't agree with that. The world says differently, but we are not obligated and we are not um, to uphold what the world says. We are to uphold what scripture says, no matter how uncomfortable it is or how much we go, I don't like that. No matter how much we feel that we have this talent or this desire, oh, I want to preach. You can proclaim the gospel. You are to proclaim the gospel as a believer in Christ but you are not told to preach and to stand in authority over men. I've repented of that personally. I would never, ever do that ever again. So I'm sitting here as a woman with a podcast to women trying to help you understand that there is proper order. And I understand that I was in violation of that order for many years when I did the things that I did and the conduct and attitude that I had. It was very prideful and arrogant. And now being part of a local church where there is there are a plurality of elders and there is a man who is a pastor considered the elder that oversees and that he teaches the word of God and that there is proper order that is desired in that local body. That brings so much more comfort and freedom in knowing that I don't have all this pressure that I'm supposed to perform and to do these different things and I'm supposed to have this authority that I walk in and, and that is 
that I'm un, and instead of recognizing that I'm under authority, that I'm under the headship of Christ, of his authority, I'm under the authority of my husband who wants to honor God and glorify Christ. It changes things to where there is actual freedom in Christ and there's protection. God has established boundaries for a reason in his word. It is not to demean or diminish our value as women, but he has established boundaries for a reason. And she has overstepped those boundaries in many things that she has done. But this in itself, this is again, the irony. She's out of order by what she's saying. She's out of order. And this leads me to this. And I appreciate you listening for this entire episode and with all the clips that I put in, because I want to show you the things that she's saying. If you listen to Catherine Crick, and even if Catherine would listen to this and and some of the leaders in this movement, they don't want to they don't want to heed the warnings because they view it as a Pharisee and a religious spirit. But I'm coming as someone who was part of this movement, who engage in some of these practices, who is repentant and has been broken before God on these matters. Repent, turn from these ways, go back to the Word of God, back to Scripture rightly understood, honor Christ. Don't despise what he has established in his word and the boundaries that God himself has established and the order that he has established. He has made things the way he has designed them in his sovereignty. And when we are obedient to him, then we're honoring Christ. We don't want to be rebellious women that are looking at things and saying, well, I'm going to do what the world says to do. I'm going to follow their standard and I'm going to do things my way and I'm going to ignore passages in scripture and I'm not going to reconcile them with my disobedience, but I'm going to ignore them when it says that a pastor, an overseer of the church is to be the husband of one wife. I'm going to ignore the passages where it says that women are not to stand in a congregation and to have authority over men that they're to be quiet. Now, there'll be some who watch this video and they'll believe that me podcasting and blogging is going in line with that and standing and usurping authority over a man. And I would encourage you to check out the video that Doreen Virtue just did with myself and Pastor Jacob Tanner. It's in the description below. And you can hear what a pastor has to say on this matter that is taking a biblical approach to this and what the scriptures actually mean in context and if women are permitted to teach other women. My concern as someone who was in this movement and engaged in some of these practices in corporate gatherings and was permitted to have authority over men and has recognized that this was sin and error against God and it was disobedient to his very word and turning from those ways. I want to warn Catherine and I want to warn those who would listen to her, please, I'm pleading with you. Go back to the word of God. My concern is for you. It's concern for her, for your soul. It is concern for honoring God and truly glorifying Christ and truly upholding the order in the church. So I hope that you found this video helpful. And I hope that you'll read this article and ultimately go back to the, the final authority, which is scripture, rightly understood. And please take a look at some of these verses. Don't ignore them and don't avoid them because it's uncomfortable. You need to look at all the counsel of God and, under, and understand that we are to obey it. No matter how uncomfortable it makes us or how much we disagree, God did not ask our opinion on what his word says and the final authority of it. So thank you for tuning in. And I look forward to being with you again as we cover another topic. And until that time, be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.